Next up on our list of reactions is the Hoffman and Copre arrangements. So, let's go through the Hoffman first. Both of them start out mostly the same. There's only one F. Whatever, spelling doesn't matter. Um, Hoffman the Hoffman rearrangement first. So, let's say we have an nitrogen and we have it in a five membered ring like this. And I'll put a wedged methyl here and a dashed methyl there. Okay, and we're going to do the Hoffman. So the Hoffman rearrangement, what will be over the arrow, will be step one, a carbon with a leaving group on it. Typically, you'll see CH3I or CH3Br. Step two will be Ag2O, water, and heat. Okay, so let's address the first step first. If you remember what we talked about at the very start regarding how nitrogen likes to react, we saw that nitrogen will attack carbons with leaving groups on them and kick the leaving group out. And so you should expect your first intermediate to look like five-membered ring, nitrogen, hydrogen, and then a methyl that we just added. Nitrogen with four bonds is positive, and then we have the wedge methyl here, and the dashed methyl here. Okay? Uh, and now, what's going to happen? The nitrogen will get deprotonated by um, a base. Probably the I minus you just made. So I minus is over here, and you're going to come in and grab that proton to make sure our nitrogen, nitrogen is nice and neutral at the end. And so you're left with a five-membered ring with nitrogen in it, wedged methyl, dashed methyl, and the methyl we just added. Now, is this the end of your step one? No, because remember what nitrogen does. Nitrogen, nitrogen loves to react. It loves to attack carbons with leaving groups on them. And so in general, <clears throat> That nitrogen will attack the uh, the leaving group, the carbon with the leaving group, a second time, and it'll keep attacking until there are no hydrogens left, and it is positive, fully saturated with carbons. So once again, the nitrogen attacks the carbon, kicks the iodine out, and now we have a nitrogen with two methyls on it, a five-membered ring, the dashed methyl, and the wedged methyl. Okay, so now that nitrogen should be positive because it gave up its lone pair and became positive. Now, what's going to happen? Now we're going to go to step two. Once that nitrogen has all the carbons it can hold, that's when step two starts. So we took care of step one, and we got this right here. Okay, is this... Ag2O and H2O. When you see Ag2O and H2O, all you have to think of is OH minus because that's what it makes. It makes OH minus. Now, one thing I should point out is heat is absolutely necessary for this reaction. If they don't tell you heat, you stop here, even if they give you step two H2O, uh, Ag2O, H2O. You need that heat for the next thing to occur that I'm going to discuss. Now, as I was saying, Ag2O, H2O, that gives you OH minus, but this isn't your typical OH minus. Usually, OH minus likes to make double bonds pull off protons from the side that gives you the most stable, most substituted um, double bond. In other words, the double, it pulls off a hydrogen where there are the fewest number of hydrogens possible. The, a, the OH minus that you get from Ag2O, however, follows the Hoffman rule. The Hoffman rule says, as a base, this OH minus will pull, and pull off a hydrogen where, the, where you have the largest number of hydrogens. So from the carbon with the most hydrogens. Well, okay, so the most hydrogens, but which carbons are we comparing? So let's start off by comparing this to old orgo one elimination reaction. We had, on one carbon, a good leaving group. For example, let's say H2O positive. 
And on the other carbon, we had the hydrogen that got pulled off by some base to do an elimination reaction, kicking out your leaving group, forming a double bond. Our goal is to make a carbon-carbon double bond. So looking at this structure, let's first look at the carbons that have, are attached to our good leaving group. What is our good leaving group in this structure? The nitrogen that is positive because it wants electrons, so it's willing to break that one of its bonds and take those electrons. Which means we have this carbon to look at, this carbon to look at, this carbon, and this carbon. Those are the four carbons that are directly attached to the nitrogen. And so that would be equivalent to this carbon right here. Now we have to go a single bond over and look at the carbons that have hydrogens relative to that. So these are automatically out because they're not connected to other carbons. So we don't have to consider the methyls. But here and here, we have, let's say this is a red dot carbon. Well, this carbon is a single bond away from it. This carbon is a single bond away for it, from it. So those are two carbons we have to consider. But are those the only carbons that are a single bond away from the green dot carbons? No, there's one that often is missed. This carbon right here, even if they gave you stereochemistry, don't forget, it's still CH3. There are, there are hydrogens there. Okay, so we have to consider this one, this one, and this one. And let's draw out our hydrogens. We have one hydrogen there. We have two here. And we have three on this one. So which set of hydrogens are, is our OH- going to pull off? Remember, pulls the hydrogen from the carbon with the most hydrogens. This one has one, this one has two, this one has three. This is our winner. So the OH- that you made will come in, grab that proton, the electrons will swing down to the carbon-carbon bond, just like what we did here, grab the proton, make a carbon-carbon double bond, kicking the leaving group out. So if you are ever worried about which, how far away from the nitrogen the hydrogen you need to pull off is, let's say nitrogen is one, and then two, three. The hydrogens you should be looking at are on three, okay? So one, two, three here, one, two, three here, one, two, three there. But we want the, the three that has the most hydrogens on it, okay? Now what will this look like based on those arrows? What you should get is the bond between two and one broke, but the bond over this way didn't, so that should still be there. We have a dashed methyl over here. We have those carbons there, that. And now that we form the double bond between two and three, so we should have that. Remember, when you form a double bond, stereochemistry disappears, and so everything's planar. So no wedges or dashes here. And then that nitrogen has two methyls on it. And so that is the general gist of the Hoffman elimination. Now what about the Cope re or oop, I said rearrangement. I meant elimination. Oops. Okay. So what about the Cope elimination? The Cope elimination is comparable to the Hoffman, but what's over the arrow is slightly different. Okay? You will still end up alkylating a nitrogen, and you'll still end up involving a nitrogen, but usually what's over the arrow in the next step, when you get to something like this, is hydrogen peroxide. Two OHs that are single bonded to each other by their, by their oxygens. And what ends up happening, and this one's a little weird, the nitrogen will attack one of the oxygens and kick the other one out. Why? Because a peroxide bond, a bond that is a single bond between two oxygens, is fairly weak. And so you could think of this the same way you think of Br2. One bromine got attacked, the other got kicked out. Same exact idea here. And so you form, you form a nitrogen with its two methyls, and now an OH. Now what will happen is the OH- minus that you kicked out will come in and deprotonate the OH that got attached to the nitrogen. So this grabs that proton, the electrons go to the oxygen, and you are left with
and O minus on the nitrogen. Okay. Now you're going to go through the exact same process you did for the Hoffman elimination. Number nitrogen 1, and find the two carbons that are 2 and 3 away from it. So here's a 2, here's a 2, but there's no 3 attached to those, so I can rule them out right away. Here's a 2, here's a 3. That's the only carbon that's 3 away, so that's the carbon you're going to consider. And that's the carbon that will get deprotonated. Who does the deprotonation, though? Well, it's the O- minus that is on the nitrogen. What happens is this O- minus will grab the proton. The proton the bond electrons will swing down to the bond between 2 and 3, forming a carbon-carbon double bond, taking the nitrogen out. And by the way, I forgot to write it, but this nitrogen has four bonds, so we should be positive, which is why it wants to break off. Okay? So the Koch elimination is just like the Hoffman, only instead of making the nitrogen positive because you add carbons to it, you use peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, to add an O- as the fourth bond. But from there, it's basically the same. Deprotonate a hydrogen, form a carbon-carbon double bond, and kick the nitrogen out. Okay, and so the final product of this elimination would be this, or almost this, this, because here's carbon 2, here's carbon 3. And remember, stereochemistry disappears when you make a double bond, or when you're attached to a double bond. This was dashed originally, but it's no longer dashed anymore. Now, just like how the Hoffman had a rule about the base pulling off from a carbon with the most hydrogens, the Koch has the opposite rule. The Koch's rule says that you pull off from the side where there are the most hydrogens. In this example, there was no choice. There was only one hydrogen Koch to pull off. But let's go back to that original ring we started with and say we were set up for a Koch elimination. So I started with a ring that looked like this. Then one methyl, and now we have an O minus. So we know we're doing the cope because we have O minus on the nitrogen. So what you're going to do is you're going to do your one, two, threes, or nitrogen one, find your two and your three, two and three, two and three. So we have this carbon, this carbon, or this carbon. And the rule for the cope we said is pull off from the carbon that has the fewest hydrogens. Okay, so which one is that? This one over here. So your base, this O minus, pulls off the proton, the electrons swing down, and the nitrogen gets kicked out. So if we had started this example with the Koch elimination, this would have been your major product. Um, the nitrogen gets kicked out and you form the double bond that is more substituted. And that's the general gist of the Koch and the Hoffman eliminations. So there is one additional rule that they just taught this semester, so I was a little uh, late to the party, but it's in regards to the Koch elimination. I had just talked about how it preferentially makes the most substituted double bond, and while this is still true, there's one rule that you have to be considerate of before you apply that first rule, and that is the Koch elimination is a sin elimination, and what that means is the hydrogen that you pull off and the nitrogen leaving group must have the same stereochemistry. And that's what sin means. Sin means the two groups have the same stereochemistry. So if I look at this example here, we know that H2O, uh, what peroxide will, or H2O2 will do, what peroxide will do is it will make an O- minus on that nitrogen and turn that nitrogen positive, come with a leaving group. And then a base, an OH- minus that's made from that, is going to come, off, come and pull off a proton. And now we have two protons to consider. We have this proton here, and we have this wedge proton here. 
And what the sin rule is saying is the only proton you can consider of the two is the one that has the same stereochemistry as your leaving group. Which means, in this example here, this is the only hydrogen that OH- could pull off. So that OH- comes in, grabs this proton, the electrons swing down, and this gets kicked out, and so the double bond will be formed on the right side of the leaving group. Okay? And so that means what you get is double bond there, this. That wedge methyl is untouched. And so this rule actually overrides the rule about most substituted double bond forming. Namely, what if I didn't have this dashed methyl here? Because before it was a tertiary versus a tertiary, there's no real difference. But now it's a secondary. So I was saying previously that, that the co-elimination favors making the most substituted double bond, which would be here. But because there is no wedged hydrogen here, the double bond would still form on this right side. And so you'd end up getting this. And I just realized, but when this was dashed over here, that dashed methyl, there would have been a methyl there. But that's the additional point I need to make about the cope elimination. And sorry about the confusion on that.